Hi, Matt Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to Chronix with Mike Fitton, who's going to talk today about what's changing in 5G. Mike, there's been a lot of talk about 5G. The whole industry is heading there. What's changing now? So the, the fascinating thing with what's happening with 5G at the moment is there's a combination of a variety of different things that are driving the requirements from a 5G perspective and, and networking in general. First of all, there's a huge number of more devices out there as we start to connect billions of interconnected devices from the edge and through the Internet of Things. There'll be lots of different devices that are connected. There's also different types of devices, things that will require very high reliability like autonomous vehicles or things that might require very low latency like some of the um, IoT sensors as well. And then the final thing is, is if you add up all of these devices and all the different usage models, then you'll start to drive this enormous increase from a bandwidth perspective. There's a couple versions of 5G. We've talked about this before. There's a sub six gigahertz, the millimeter wave, and probably various different uh, bands of millimeter wave in there as well. Have the use cases changed because we start moving into millimeter wave? Does that start changing things on a fundamental level? It changes things from a deployment model. The, the propagation characteristics of uh, the microwave bands, the higher bands that we're going to be using, just means that you need to have much less distance between cell phone towers. And cell phone towers will also be deployed in different ways because the propagation into buildings is then different. So you'll have a, a large number of new types of, uh, of wireless infrastructure for 5G. But it will also, as we had previously, it'll be a great way of driving the bandwidth requirements that we have as well, because there's large amounts of bandwidth available in these higher bands. Let's drill down into how all this is going to go together. Sure. What are we looking at here, Mike? So previously when we spoke, Ed, we talked about what was happening at the edge of the network in, the, in terms of the radio and the baseband associated with that. Before we get there, what I'd like to do is take a step back and look about how the data gets from the core of the network out to the edge. And this is still a massive amount of data that you have to move, right? And that's exactly right. And that's the problem that we're seeing at the moment. There's such a huge amount of data and we're seeing a really rapid increase in the amount of bandwidth that's required. The move from 10 gig Ethernet to 40 gig Ethernet, then to 100 and 400, is rapidly evolving in terms of a network bandwidth requirement. And even if we solve the problem of pre-processing at the very edge of wherever the endpoint is, that's still going to produce a lot of data with all the sensors, right? Exactly. So you can do some data processing at the edge, which we'll cover in a different talk. But it, even if you're doing that, it's still a huge amount of data that's going to need to get from the network core, maybe the data center, and then start to proliferate out to, to the edge. So what does the architecture look like? So from an architectural perspective, there's a variety of different network uh, pieces of network equipment. FPGA is very commonly used in this kind of area because of the inherent flexibility and power efficiency associated with that. But even FPGAs are starting to run into some challenges as well. So let's drill down into these challenges. How does the architecture have to change? Yeah, that's a great question. So if we look at uh, a kind of cartoon of an FPGA here on the board, what we've got is we've got this enormous bandwidth pipe coming in. It's this huge amount of data that's coming in. So we've got 400 gig Ethernet that you could support, for example, as four by 100 gig circuits. Right? So a few years ago, that would have seemed unbelievable. That's what we've got emerging today in, in latest generation silicon. Now imagine you've got this coming into a regular FPGA. What's going to happen is you're going to have a pipe that's 1,024 bits wide. And because of the nature of how Ethernet works, that's going to need to work at about 700 megahertz. Now today's FPGAs can work at these kind of high rates, but closing timing and getting the design to work across such a wide bus at 1K bits wide is really problematic. And so that's when we start to need to revisit the inherent FPGA architecture and make some changes. What kind of changes are you talking about? Well, if we think about this challenge of bringing all this data in here, so one way to address this challenge is to have some kind of network on chip, which is well used elsewhere. Now, you can have two aspects of the network on chip. You would be able to, let's say, take this 400 gig Ethernet stream and write it out to external memory, either DDR4, DDR5, or GDDDR6. And if you use a NOC, you can do this without using any FPGA resources at all. Another aspect of a network on chip is also the fact that you can start to take this data and break down the streams and use a network on chip to bring it into the FPGA itself. And by splitting it into, let's say, four different buses, each of 256 bit wide, 
you get a much more realistic problem to solve in the FPGA logic here. And one of the nice things about a NOC is that all the connections to various different IPs are already done for you, right? So you can basically just plug all this in. Exactly. It's very easy to use. It's very easy to close timing in that you're not trying to close timing with the FPGA resources. And you don't have to w waste any of your precious, soft, flexible, reconfigurable resources here in your FPGA in doing the network on chip aspects because that's all hardwired. And where that helps is even if you're not running at 400 gig Ethernet, if you're running at 100 gig, you're still being much more efficient because you're not using any of your FPGA resources be to be doing that routing of large bandwidth data. So where does the programmability come in? What can you do with this with a so you have your network all set up? Can you reprogram how things are done on that network? Yeah, this is a great question. This really comes to why people use it, um, FPGAs. If you look at once you've got the data on chip right here, what's the kind of workloads that we can support? And the, the, the workloads that you've got here in your reprogrammable logic are, are really varied and they're dependent on what the end application is. So if we think, for example, one of the big things we see is the need for cryptography with uh, crypto requirements for TLS 1.3, for IPsec and MacSec. As new crypto standards emerge and as we have um, proprietary or uh, custom requirements for 5G, you can have that as a reprogrammable resource here within the FPGA is one great example of a workload that's possible in that space. And you don't necessarily know where these workloads are going to be or what they're going to look like because this is an evolving space, right? Yeah, and it's evolving in a number of different dimensions. We've got evolving requirements from um, a standards perspective. You know, as 5G emerges and we have requirements for autonomous vehicles, the processing will be very different than what we have for enhanced mobile broadband. Equally, there's different requirements from the end applications as well. And there's also different requirements from the operators themselves. So all of these things layered on top of themselves mean that you're likely to need some kind of flexibility and reprogrammability even out into the field once the system has been deployed. And this can be multiple lanes of data and you could say this one is being used more now than a, a different one would be in the future? Yeah, so then you have the flexibility of doing some statistical multiplexing between all of the different lanes and then you can devote more resources to one type of processing than another. This is a fairly common networking problem. What does it mean specifically for 5G? Yeah, that's a good point. So all these kind of requirements is something that we've classically seen in any kind of networking switch or smart NIC application. What it means specifically for 5G, as we start to move towards the edge of the network, we're going to have the ability to instantiate some really interesting workloads here. So we talked already about being able to do some crypto functions in general, but also specifically for 5G. Um, there's things like compression and edge analytics that we'll talk about in another of these talks. Um, but one of the ones I really want to focus on is some of the machine learning resources that you can have here in your FPGA, what kind of thing can you do with that? And there's a couple of really interesting applications there, particularly with, um, there's some applications the ITU is currently looking at using MPP, mobile pattern positioning, to optimize the radio resources and the functions that you've got. And so that might be a different deployment of the FPGA from what you're seeing here, but you're using that flexibility to adapt and maximize the bandwidth that you're gonna get out of your wireless network. Is there really going to be one 5G or is it going to be lots of implementations depending upon what people are doing with it? Yeah, I think 5G, if you ask 10 different people what 5G is, you'll get 11 different answers. So it's a huge wide variety of different requirements from fixed wireless access uh, through enhanced mobile broadband, through some of the ultra reliable communication and even massive machine type connectivity. Layered on top of that is the legacy aspects of, of what you will also want to support being able to connect to old radio units and still be able to use them. So if you're an engineer in this space and you're building a chip, what do you need to think about as you're putting this together? I think you need to think about three different aspects of it. In the past, the present and the future. The past is what's the legacy stuff that I still need to connect to? So if you think, let's deploy this FPGA in like a front hall connect connectivity, connecting between a baseband going through to some radios that are here at the bottom. So as you connect out here, what you're going to do is you want to connect to a legacy radio that might be a CIPRI or OBSI interface. So that's some already deployed 4G infrastructure that you would want to be able to connect. That's kind of the past. If we look at where most areas are going at the moment with radio over Ethernet or eCIPRI, that's kind of where requirements are at the moment. But you also need to layer on top of that the requirements that you might see in the future from different operator requirements and different applications 
And that's where the ORAN standard and the ORAN consortium is pushing things going forward. And so that's, again, why we particularly see a need for flexibility in this space to be able to adapt to the different algorithm requirements here. And each one of those is going to change as we go forward, right? Yeah, exactly right. So each of them, and we will see different changes in each of the different standards here. And then particularly the workloads that we're looking at accelerating here will also be modified over time as new applications come out and deployment models change. So let me get this straight. You're now dealing with multiple different levels of everything that will change in an environment that also will be changing, and you're trying to fit these pieces together and make them all work together. Yeah, it's, it's, it kind of sounds like a difficult challenge, right? Basically what we're doing is we're throwing all the pieces on the board up in the air, and we're kind of seeing where they land. You know, from a classic network deployment point of view, some of the baseband functions are migrating more towards the radio. Some of the higher layer functions are more migrating back more towards uh, virtualized network functions that can be deployed elsewhere. And so you've got a movement of functions, and you've also got different deployment models, as we talked about previously. Are things deployed as a classic macro cell, or a cloud RAN, or a street level macro? So in that case, what you're going to need is to be able to deploy this kind of semiconductor infrastructure in different places. So that's why we're seeing different ASICs and SOCs in different places but we're also seeing FPGAs deployed in the data center. We're seeing FPGAs deployed in a classic base station, but we're also seeing FPGA and specifically embedded FPGA integrated with ASIC in the radio endpoints and even the aggregation layer. Mike Fitton, thanks for a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much.